Today's lesson is from Samuel chapter 7, starting with the first verse. As King David wonders about building God a house, God's prophet Nathan reminds David that it was God who built a house for David. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that, that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built a house made of built why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod yielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. The word of the Lord. And now I'd like to invite the young folks of the church to come forward, whoever would like to come up. And um, I have asked my daughter Abby to help with this message for you. Because I said, well, hmm, Pastor Bird is here and I don't have to write a sermon, so why should I have to also work on something for the kids? So I said, Abby, you do it. She said, okay. So, okay. Uh, do you know what this, hey children, do you know what this is? Uh, you have a close, it's a duplo. I, I think it's a duplo. So, um, so the way how God um, builds Builds houses. That's the way we how we build with two blows or some, any like that, or anything like these. So you um, just show up. I'm just gonna get back some bunch of things I built early earlier before. Okay. So she's gonna show you something that she created, and what she wanted to talk to you about is how you build it. Um, if you're building something for somebody, do you just make it or do you check it out? Like say, what do you want me to build for you? Do you want to check with them? Yeah, because maybe they don't want that. And maybe it's the wrong color or something like that. So these are something that Abby has already created. Yeah, sorry. Minus one thing that Abby has already created. No problem, it can be fixed. All right. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. 
said this here is some, I mean, some kind of a girl with the animal boutique. Well, I have a, and this one is. Why is there a fire hydrant? Um, the dog will want the dog will need it. The dog will need it. <laughs> and here's the car. Okay. And here is Superman. Oh wow. Yep, he, he is tall and sweet. No, not tall, but he's he's not afraid of heights and he can carry like a heavy thing, like this fence. So we can build things. There's no question we are able to build things. And like we said before, we sometimes want to check with people to make sure. So did you notice in the story, David wanted to build something? What did he want to build? A cedar house. A place for God to be, the Ark of the Covenant. And, um, and, and he just said, let me build your house by. <laughs> so that we got it. Um, what do you remember God said? God was like, did I ask for a house? I didn't ask for a house. So this, just like a little bit of a reminder, um, if we can build things and it's wonderful and we can use our gifts and talents, but it's really important to also check with people and make sure it's okay. Like if you're using some of these building blocks, you might say, oh, you, these are your building blocks, can I work with you? And then that's always a good to check with that. And you might say, let's build something together sometime. Um, but this is a reminder that you also want to make sure we check with somebody so that we don't build something they don't want. And that happens sometimes when we think we know what somebody wants. And just that simple, like, what do you want is a nice thing. Like, have you ever been to a restaurant um, and your mom or your dad just ordered something for you? Like, wait, I didn't want that this time. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, for years I only wanted spaghetti and meatballs. And then I decided I was done, and the next time I went to a restaurant, my folks said, oh, she wants spaghetti and meatballs. I was like, I do not. You have not asked me what I wanted. So sometimes you want to check with people. So building is good. The ability to do things is good. But we want to make sure we check with people. We're going to check with God, too. So now we're going to say a prayer asking that we can just take a step back and think about what other people need and, and do that very simple thing of checking with them. So whatever I say, you say in a prayer. Let's go. Dear God. Dear God, open our eyes to see the need to ask people what they want, what they need, instead of just doing what we want. Help us to love by being aware. By being aware of other people. Of other people. Amen. Amen. So really it's as simple as that. We can do things, we should do things, but sometimes we should check in. Alright, do you want to put these back at it? Oh, oh, no, you should this is a applause for her she did a nice job with this one. Yes!
to be here with you all this morning. Um, you may not have known that that was coming, but I thank you for welcoming me <laughs> and for uh, the hospitality already I've, I've gotten to feel uh, being here. So it's, it's wonderful to be here. My name is Dan Burton, and I'm a visitor here. I actually live in Michigan, um, but I, I work with Global Refuge, which is an organization you all have, have supported. I want to start by telling you how you have supported Global Refuge, uh, and just to catch us all up, just to make sure uh, you know what I'm thanking you for, because it does it does so happen that this text from 2 Samuel today, I think really gives a good um, framework to understand the impact of the work that you do. So, First Nathan has supported Global Refuge in a few ways, but the most regular and, uh, I think, impactful way is that you are one of three congregations in the whole country that act as a hub for us in our Hope for the Holidays program. So Hope for the Holidays is a national program where we invite communities to write handwritten messages that can be received by new arrivals that we work with. Refugees, asylum seekers, most of them go towards our CFS families. So kiddos and families that are just, just landing and we're helping them establish some roots get connected to a community, find school, etc. You can imagine those are really vulnerable moments of transition. So this car riding program is an attempt during the Christmas season to just whisper a little love into that vulnerability, to, to send some messages of dignity and hope. We're praying for you, we love you, Merry Christmas, welcome, just things like that, which you can imagine, especially in uh, Context like this year, this election year, those those messages go a long way. If somebody just feels seen and loved and respected. But those three hubs, like First English, you receive those cards and sort through them. So you're kind of the the, uh, the touch points where everybody mails them to. This there's this one here in Baltimore. There's one in Illinois. And the other one's in California. So those are kind of the dispatch centers where everybody sends the cards to. But the work isn't logistical, the work is humane. Uh, the hubs kind of sift through the cards just to make sure that all the messages are loving and they can be filled and appropriate. So that's an important point in making sure that that love is communicated faithfully. And that's not the only thing that the first English does. But that's the part I'm going to talk about today. And I also just want to, I want you to hear the gratitude from me, sure, but also from the folks that receive these cards. It really is such a heartfelt moment uh, in a time that can be stressful for families, um, and you all help make that happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. The text today I mentioned gives us a good framework to understand this, so I want to, uh, I want to dive into a section from it. And Global Refuge, <coughs> if you didn't know, in addition to doing Hope for the Holidays, it's a resettlement agency. So we work with receiving refugees and asylum seekers, kiddos, around the country and finding them a safe space to go. Churches are an enormous part of that. Churches are a huge part of that. And I think today's text gives a good window into why that is. So I'm just going to reread two lines from the scripture for today. After the king was settled into his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in the house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. So that's actually the part that's depicted on the front of your bulletin there. David is just kind of, it kind of seems like he feels bad. He's like, I got this fancy house, the Ark of the Covenant, where God is believed to dwell, is out in a tent. So he's like, maybe I should just build this gorgeous temple. And then God, as we've heard, is like, I didn't ask him to do that. So that's the part I want to talk about. David's kind of kicking his feet up in the palace, and he feels bad that the Ark is out in a tent. For me, that kind of has a very similar energy to like a Christmas time in my family when we host everybody. We got everybody in the house and we kind of, we have a small house. So we kind of put everybody where they can fit, including uh, my father-in-law on a futon in the room with the kids. And sometimes when we're talking into our master bedroom, I feel a little bit bad because I'm like, my father-in-law's over there with the kids and the futon, and this, this, this kind of feels similar to that. <laughs> David has kicked his feet up in the temple. There's been a lot going on. He's reclining there, and he's like, I just feel a little bit bad that God's outside of the tent. It's kind of how I feel on Christmas when my father-in-law's on the futon. I did not, however, set out to build my father-in-law a new room with the kids. 
But I like that that verse because I think it is such a human detail that we all do. That's really hard to hard to miss. It's it's King David after all, and there's all this there's visions and stuff. So it's hard to imagine yourself as thinking this, but put yourself like let me just like boil it down in very plain terms. Like he was in his nice house, and God was outside, and he's like, oh, I should build God a nice house too. That's a very human thing to do. He feels a little guilty and he wants to do something about it. And I think that that's something that happens an awful lot in work with the church, in service work, in mission work, in charity work. So David has has it on his heart to build this temple, and God rebuffs that, saying, are you the one to build me a house? Which has a little bit of attitude in it. Are you the one to make me a house? God explains, I am the one who builds a house for you. So while David was thinking of a literal house, God is referring to the, to the sacred lineage, the family line that he's going to build out of David. That is much bigger than a house. That is much more eternal than a house. So God's trying to reorient David, saying, like, no, 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 first of all, you don't build me a house, I, I build houses. Second of all, the house I build spans through all of time, isn't found in one location, doesn't need keys to open. I'm going to build a house through you. So God kind of reorients that to have a much bigger scope. There's a, a commentary that puts it, puts it like this. It's not David's place to be the benefactor, to build God a house. Rather, it's God who will act faithfully to David, building him a different kind of house, a succession of leaders who will guide God's people in their relationship with God. David resembles this very human tendency because he wants to do something for God when God has a bigger plan. And as I said, I think this happens very often in, in the church. Let me give you an example. And while I'm giving you this example, I want you to keep in mind this, this scene, that moment where David's like, ah, maybe I should build God a really nice house. So just keep that moment in mind. My, my first job out of college was in El Salvador. I was with ELCA Global Mission. I was an interpreter for the Salvador Lutheran Church. So I translated English, Spanish, Spanish, English for churches that came to visit that gave me a really good perspective on church work because I was translating people's partnerships for two years. 37 different groups and churches who were there to visit a partner, and I would translate for them. So I, I got to learn a lot from their kind of trial and error, <laughs> the things that worked, the things that didn't. And I was intimately involved because the words were coming out of my mouth. I was part of the right in the middle of the exchange, and that really impressed upon me. There was one thing that, uh, that happened a few times, but I'll give you the most uh, impactful example. There was a community that came down and fell in love with the kids at, uh, at the center where we stayed, at the community we visited. They fell so in love with the kids, and they brought them gifts every year they came, and just grew closer and closer to them. And for them, it was the kids that really made those mission trips worthwhile. And so one year they went and raised a whole bunch of money, a lot of money, in the U.S., and then came back and announced it to the Salvadoran bishop, we have good news, Bishop Gomez, we're prepared to build an orphanage for the Salvadoran Lutheran Church. We're going to build y'all an orphanage. Nobody asked for an orphanage. Nobody said an orphanage was needed. And think about the inference when you say, don't worry, we got you, we'll build you an orphanage. It implies that your kids need one, that they're not taken care of, that they're in that, they needed that service. And I was translating this conversation, and I remember seeing Bishop Gomez's eyes go really wide, and just like, look at me, and I'm like, I'm just the translator. <laughs> um, and he said, very plainly, we do not need an orphanage in El Salvador. We take care of our kids. What we do need is wells a well for water. We need a well in every community. I would love to repurpose your generosity and direct it towards a livelihood, access to clean water, <laughs> something we need. And this, this guy said, uh, we'll find another nonprofit through which we can build this orphanage. So he said, no, the bishop, and went elsewhere to build this orphanage. He 
his love had taken on such a shape with those kiddos in that country that it didn't make sense any other way but to do what he had envisioned. He really wanted to build this temple. It came from a good place, kind of like David's dream of building God a, a house. It was coming from a good place. It was out of love, maybe a little bit of guilt about his privilege, too. That's certainly an undertone in this story as well. But he was trying to build the wrong thing. And in trying to do that, he really offended a whole community, telling them that they weren't taking care of their kids. I will never forget that experience, how uncomfortable that was, and how disappointed I was that they decided to just say, fine, bye. We'll go elsewhere and build this orphanage. Not because that's what they need, but it's because I, what I, that's what I want to do. Imagine if, if this second Samuel story today ended with David being like, ah, I'm going to build it anyways. I'll find another ark to cover it with there or something. <laughs> no, he's, he's faithful. He's, he, he listens to that and, of course, becomes the, the father of the sacred lineage into which Jesus is blessed and born as well, which is how it extends to all of us. So, you know, thank God, God decided to build that house instead. Because the other one would be in the ruins now. And yet we get to live in that truth today. When we compartmentalize God and our experience of God into something small enough that we can build or understand or wrap our hands around, wrap our head around, when we compartmentalize it down to that size, we diminish our experience of God. And we diminish others' experience of God, too. Let me say that one more time, more succinctly. When we shrink God down to something that we can wrap our hands around, we diminish our and others' experience of God. It's a disservice to God. It shrinks the house that God is trying to build. And I would say literally and theologically. It shrinks our experience of God. That's the case in David trying to build this temple. God was thinking bigger. That's the case that story I just shared in El Salvador. God was thinking bigger. And I think it's something that we do also today on a daily basis, maybe weekly, monthly basis. When we go through the ebb and flow of things that we feel, we want to do something about it. That was in the children's sermon as well. We want to build. We can build. We got the tools, the resources. We want to do something. That's not always what we're supposed to do. It's not always what works. And I think we diminish the experience of God in a lot of ways. We diminish it down to one way of living, one way of loving, one way of representing God in our midst. But when we compartmentalize God down to one small thing, we lessen, we shrink our experience of what God is trying to do. Let me give you one more short example. And this one is a little more close to home. I get to visit a lot of churches in this role, in this local refuge. I'm an ELCA pastor, and I'm a mission developer in this city, in the Delaware, Maryland city. So I get to visit lots of churches around the country, and lots of visits here. There are lots of churches here. And there's a narrative that popped up a lot, but I, I haven't quite put my finger on the pattern, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it out loud today. Maybe you can puzzle it together in your head, too. Often, and this is the case for my own church in Chicago, too. Often when I visit a place as a, as a guest, um, I'm met with an almost kind of apologetic enthusiasm about, like, oh, we used to have, the, the pews used to be full. We used to have 33 services on a Sunday morning or something like that. Just like, the church used to be bigger and fuller, that, that type of narrative, which, like, I share that longing. I remember that with my own church, too. And it's not as full these days. So I understand that there's a, Kind of like there used to be kids running through the halls, and there used to be so many people. And, uh, but hey, this is still church. This is still church. Like this kind of the response that I give to that. This happened one time, and afterwards, uh, a couple of folks asked if I could go out to to brunch with them before I went to the airport. And in this brunch, uh, folks were sharing about their experience renting their sanctuary, uh, renting this space to uh, Latin community, a local Spanish speaking. Congregation. And as they were describing it, my uh, my ears were perking. I was getting very excited because let me just say some say some of the things they said said down there. There's kids running through the halls. The church building is full every day of the week. Our services are overflowing, and they're bilingual. And I'm hearing those words, and I'm getting excited because I'm thinking, my goodness, that could not be any more direct 
response to the things we're just saying. Oh, I, I long for those days. I wish those kids were in the halls. Their services would to overflow. And hallelujah, it, it is happening now. That's beautiful, except that's not the tone in which they were listing those things. Kids are running through the hall. Services are overflowing. It's bilingual. The church building is full every day, every day of the week. Those were all complaints. They were complaining. Not like rudely or outwardly, but they were lamenting. They were, they were venting about that. And I pointed out, hopefully, pastorally, like, hey, look at those match the things you were saying earlier today. Praise God, right? Like, isn't this great? Can we find a way to? But you know, I'm visiting Greek. That's a long pastoral conversation. You know, I, I didn't have time to get that far at that, that brunch. But I, I left that meeting with a broken heart because if we're honest about the roadblock there, what's keeping them from experiencing joy in having kids run through the halls again and services be full? was that it was full of the wrong people. Um, xenophobia or racism maybe was behind that. Or just a lack of connection, maybe more benevolently. They just hadn't gotten to build relationships with the community yet. Either way, there was work to do. And it's something that happens a lot. So I think we do the same thing of, of envisioning, envisioning a, this is a very handy artwork on Bolton. I'm using it a lot this morning. Um, but envisioning something that we want to build. Those, those, those folks out of a very good place in their heart wanted their church to be big and full one day. They wanted to build that building for God. But what they were envisioning was excluding people. Because God delivered, God answered that prayer and filled that church to the brim. Filled it with people, filled with life, filled with language. Could have been an amazing vision of the kingdom of God and a prayer being answered. But folks had a different building in mind. So I, I share that example to say that this can, this can happen easier than we, than we think. And I think that the cure for that, the way around that, is building relationships, is remembering what God decided to build instead. God said, no thank you to this physical building. I'm building a family. I'm building a family that spans through all of time. And I think that's the same pivot that we need to do when we can. If I were to visit with that church again, which I'm sure I will, I'll, I'll bring that up. I'll bring up Second Samuel. That look, hey, when when God sees the buildings we try to build, God responds by saying, "I'm building a family." Remember that. You want to build something for me? Open your doors. You want to build something for me? Walk in somebody in. You want to build something for me? Tell somebody they're loved, they're welcomed, they're part of this family. That's the house. It's the same house that God has been building this whole time. And we keep trying to build new beautiful buildings or fill up the buildings that we have. But we got to remember that God is still just building this family over time. It cannot be owned by any one person. It can't, it doesn't belong in one physical spot. There's no keys to get into it. That's the house that God's building to us. Anytime we reach outside of our physical houses to extend the welcome, it's built in that house. And you all have a history of doing that, being a part of that. So again, hear my thanks. And also, Thanks be to God for the house that we're part of that you're helping build. Thank you. 
for prayer. There will be a time for you to ask petitions for anybody special. Challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. Holy One, we give thanks for all the servant leaders of the church. Bless bishops, pastors, and deacons with humble wisdom as they follow and serve you in various occasions. Crown them in your love. God, your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creative woman, kindle in us a spirit of caring strength in the, in the preservation of habitats, food availability, and centers of refuge that all wildlife may thrive. God, your mercy. Hear our prayer. Empowering one, fill the leaders of governments with the spirit of service that prioritizes those on the margins due to job loss, underemployment, unsafe working conditions, and immigration status. May economic equity be achieved for all people. God, your mercy. Hear our prayer. Restoring one, send your angels to watch over, rescue, and protect those who are recovering from Hurricane Helene and Hurricane Milton. Nurse those who suffer hardship, disease, injury, or difficulty with your comfort and peace, especially among our members, Andrew, Carol, Helen, Norm, Glenn, Frankie, Matthew, Tim, Barbara, David, Margo, and Jean. And among our friends, Mary, Jay, and family, Debbie, Steffi, Mark, Russell, Mama, Julia, Matt, Mike, David, Guanyi, Rick, Brian, Mary, Matt, and Leah, and those we remember silently in our hearts. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Abiding one, inspire all ordained ministers and seminarians to ministry that challenges, engages, and comforts those in their care. God, your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for people and places mired in conflict, like Ukraine, Russia, Artsakh, Turkey, Syria, Afghanistan, Haiti, Myanmar, Ethiopia, Lebanon, Belarus, Japan, Libya, Sudan, Yemen, Israel, the Church in the Holy Land, particularly Jerusalem and our siblings in Gaza. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our leaders, Joe, Wes, and Brandon, for our presiding bishop, Elizabeth, as well as our Delaware, Maryland bishop, Bill, and their staff. Unite us with our neighbors in Baltimore, our online mission field, and those in the 12 step programs offered in our coffee house. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Saving one, we give thanks for the disciples, James and John, and all saints who have faithfully served you. We rejoice in a promised place at the Feast of Victory that we receive by your grace alone. God, your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Savior and Lord. The Lord be with you. Please rest. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, O God, our Father and Mother, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Jesus welcomes you to this table. Come. 
here is God. together. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So you have 
a, an insert with all kinds of different things that are going on in our church. First of all, confirmation is after church. We're going to start at 11.15, so you have a little bit of time to go to coffee hour before I go to the library. Um, we have a couple of Bible studies going on, adult forum, um, things like that. But next week, as you see in your bulletin announcements, we are going to be worshiping with our friends at St. Mark. So our worship here is not going to be taking place here in this structure, Red Bird Bird. But we are going to uh, work on that relationship we have with our, our fellow congregation at St. Mark's. We'll be worshiping Reformation Sunday with them, and it um, should be a wonderful thing. It's an 11 o'clock service. Make sure you mark that. So we won't have Sunday school or a forum next week, um, not on Sunday morning. So at 11 o'clock, we would love for you to show up at St. Mark's, and the address is in the bulletin. We have a movie night coming up. This coming up Friday, we're going to uh, to show the movie Coco, and it's this colorful animated movie. We're making it at 6.30, so it's a little bit earlier than our other movie nights have been, and that way it's more welcoming for our kids. We would love for whole families to come. It's one of my favorite Pixar movies, and even movies. I think you can take off Pixar. It's just a lovely show. Um, we're asking a $1 donation to defray the cost of licensing, and we invite people, as usual, to bring something to share. And since it takes place in Mexico, some kind of a Mexican dish would be awesome, like nachos or something, if you're trying to think thematically. Um, we have a concert coming up at First English in a couple of weeks on November 3rd. It's the Bach in Baltimore concert. Um, it will be here with Bach, Telemann, and Elgar. And so it's at 4 o'clock. There's a, a link if you would like to uh, participate to get tickets for that. Also, uh, there's another concert, Rock and Friends, takes place today, and that's at St. John's Lutheran Church on Hartford Road in Fargo. We are still asking people to send cards. Um, I know that our friend Tim is really appreciating cards, so the address is in the bulletin if you wanted to send him a little note. He could say, hey, happy Reformation Day, thinking of you, just to give you an idea. Um, we have a big announcement about the holly tree that we have had trimming done, um, and this is long time coming. So if you didn't notice, maybe you came in another door, maybe you want to just pop your head out and see how that has turned out. So um, do you have anything you wanted to add about that, Julie, or just stick with the announcement? Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, and during the months of October and November, we are taking a noisy change offering. There's a, a little bucket in the back, and if you have change you want to throw in, we would like to make some kind of a donation, and this is to recognize the 50th anniversary of ELCA World Hunger. So that's an opportunity for you. As I've said before, it doesn't have to be noisy. If you want to put in a silent offering, aka a check or bills, whatever, that's gratefully accepted as well. Um, those are the main things that are going up. The Chosen is still being shown by the, the claim group. And Paul, do you have anything to add about the 200th anniversary next year? Okay. Okay, great. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation? Okay, I just want to thank again uh, the Reverend Dan Byrne for coming to share his insights with us and uh, to preside over communion and just give us that worship experience that that opens our minds just a little bit. I pre really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. We continue on, so please rise for the blessing and commissioning. As we prepare to step back into the world, may we find beauty and joy in all we see and in the people we encounter. Breathe deep, open your eyes, see the work of our Creator, and may you know God's blessing this week. Amen. Our sending song is On Our Way Rejoicing. Oh. 